Hello, and welcome to Bomb Squad Movie Night. I'm your host, Ethan Hawker, and with me I have... I'm Space Pirate Captain Harlock M. Sullivan. I changed my poster background. Hi, I'm the voice actor of the Mole from Atlantis doing an impression of the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. And joining us, we have very special guest. Hello, I'm Coop Bicknell. I do things. What's up? (laughs) Hello. (laughs) <laughs> and today, we'll be taking off to Parts Unknown with Rintaro's 1978 adaptation of the Leiji Matsumoto classic, Galaxy Express 39. Uh, but first, um, before we, we get into the nitty gritty of, of this film, its creatives, all that, Coop, a wonderful guest, uh, aka some may know him as at Rider Strike on Twitter, prolific writer for sites like Anime Herald, Zimmerit, and Anime News Network, and then also podcaster for Do Do You Remember Macross, a very good listen covering largely Macross material but dipping into other things, including the likes of the Dirty Pair um, and Robotech, that filth, that garbage, in which they did an episode <laughs> on Robotech featuring me, where they let me pick the episodes I wanted to show them and everything. A terrible decision in general. But Coop, before we, we get into things, if you'd like to discuss a bit more in depth what you do, by all means. So that was a terrible decision. Robotech is the worst. No, we we had so much fun going over those and also had a blast learning that Abraham Lincoln was involved in that. It's totally radical, dudes. But yeah, I do a bunch of stuff right now. Yeah, I've written stuff for Anime Herald, Simmerit, Anime News Network, like a bunch of really niche things like, yo, who are the people who did the subtitles on that one anime from like 20 years ago? Or, yo, who did the uh, subtitles. It's a lot of subtitle related things. I really like talking to people who work in localization and the stories of the things they do that a general wider audience might never really hear about or know about. So I always like talking to those folks and I learn a lot and somehow through doing that I now work in localization a little bit too as an editor working on some light novels. Uh, do you remember Macross is one of those things I co-host with the wonderful Dylan Gregory at the Dilla on on Twitter. He's a wonderful person, a wonderful actor, but we've both been like super busy because I got my stuff and he's a working actor, so he's keeping busy. But on Dude You Remember, we have covered pretty much everything Macross so far. We're about like halfway through Delta and we'll get to the rest of it when we have time. But again, we've been busy. We're coming up on almost having done that for four years. It's crazy that we're almost done with it. It's kind of wild to think, but the, the best part about about it is through it I've gotten to meet Mr. Ethan Hawker over here and then all of you finally here today because I saw that episode you did with Steven a while back and I'm just like messaging Ethan be like so yeah anime we you want to talk about it on a movie night sometime potentially <laughs> and then I talked to Tim a little bit and he's like yo that Utena is really good and I'm like uh oh, I gotta watch Antenna and I haven't yet. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but yeah, that's that's me for the most part. I need to watch Utena and do other things. <laughs> you should. Utena is really good. We also have a very good episode of Bomb Squad Podcast, the old show mm-hmm. featuring Dawn of the Animated Nostalgia Podcast. But no, um, regarding uh, Coop's work, especially uh, that, that recent article, particularly on the uh, Anime Go commentary with Noboru Ishiguro, really, really loved that and your coverage of uh, particularly the Macross Frontier films, which, you know, sort of riding off the high of those coming out in theaters in America. God, nobody ever thought that would happen. And that it no, did. it's crazy. On a similar note, I was at Otakon. They showed a little bit of the Frontier short film, The Labyrinth of Time, for the first time anywhere outside Japanese theaters. And I kind of cried a little bit, like three times while watching this 15 minute short, because I'm like, I would never expect this to ever happen. And yet it did. It's crazy. Legendary. Uh, if you'd like uh, links to any of that stuff, you can obviously find it down in their description. But Away from plugs, no more brand synergy. It's time to discuss the work we're um, going to discuss today as we pay tribute to uh, what might be the single best adaptation of the great Leiji Matsumoto's work. I don't know you. My name is Tetsuro Hoshino and you killed my mother, you metal bastard! Um, To start us off, sort of 
dour, I suppose, but I, I do think it is fitting that we pay tribute to the man himself, as on uh, February 13th, 2023, the artist and creative visionary Leiji Matsumoto passed away. While we mourn his passing, I feel that if we can learn anything from today's subject, uh, it's that life's beauty and meaning are found in just how fleeting it is. Uh, so I was hoping we could focus on the legacy created in his brief, wonderful time with us before he left us to sail the Sea of Stars. Uh, what is your history with the works of Leiji Matsumoto? Whether this be one of his original creations, uh, work he contributed to, or just something largely influenced by his work. Tim, would you like to start us off? A lot of my knowledge of his work is sort of peripheral. The things I've watched that he worked on, I watched the uh, old Captain Harlock TV show a few years back, and I really did enjoy that quite a bit. Captain Harlock is one of those just like infinitely cool classic characters, kind of like Cobra. I also have, of course, seen uh, Interstellar 4 5, which we did a podcast on, which uh, he was the supervisor on. I also watched a little OVA from uh, the 90s called The Cockpit, which uh, I don't remember super well, but uh, it's, it's a fun one to kind of summarize just sort of my appreciation of Leiji Matsumoto, even though I haven't watched a whole lot of his work. Just, just to kind of briefly go over sort of the impact he had on the anime industry in America. Like, I'm a huge fan of Toonami and Jason DeMarco and Gil Austin, who run Toonami. They grew up on syndicated anime that were airing in the 70s and 80s, which included a Star Blazers, the American adaptation of a space battleship Yamato. So if it weren't for Matsumoto's work, Toonami probably wouldn't exist. And that is really one of the big things from the 90s that really skyrocketed that anime boom. And that's a huge part of like why you see anime in stores now like it's it's everywhere it's streaming everywhere and that's just one small piece of just like how much of an impact he's had on the culture over here you know not to even speak on all that he's done for japanese media as a whole so that's basically my two cents uh, back to you ethan Absolutely. I think Matsumoto, basically, since his work really began, particularly that, that boom period in the, the late 70s for him in Japan, uh, just contemporaneously, his, his work uh, has always been uh, coming over to America in some format. Star Blazers, obviously, being the most prominent, but Harlock, Queen Millennia, the, this film, even, Vanguard Ace, Starzinger, etc., etc., all came over here in some format, whether it be truncated or heavily edited or e even in a more true blue, like Harlock aired on you know U.S. television with English subtitles in select markets. He's just always been there, ubiquitous, and Harlock's image on the cover of uh, issue three of Fanfare was a lot of people's, you know, first introduction to the, the idea that these cartoons are Japanese. It's a survey of TV animation in Japan. Galaxy Express 3.9, Captain Harlock, Giant Robots, and more, I say as I hold up my copy of Fanfare issue three. So yeah, <laughs> a hugely significant in the development of uh, Japanese animation awareness in the States. Cannot undersell that enough. But Joe, what is your uh, history with Matsumoto? My history with him is extremely limited in that the only thing that I've even seen that has his name on it is Interstellar for five, which he was the supervising director on, according to IMDb and according to what Tim just said. Literally anything else I've never seen, because if you've seen any of the previous anime like movie stuff that I've been on, you will know that I am not an anime guy. But I'm wanting to expand that. I'm wanting to change that a bit, hence why I'm here. So yeah, that's my answer. Back to you, Ethan. <laughs> No, I mean, that's completely valid to be like, uh, surely you've probably encountered some sort of animation or something that has a little bit of influence from him. It's possible, yeah. Yeah, just because it's so ubiquitous at this point, mm -hmm. just even if it's just like a, like a Harlock cameo or, or somebody in a tall, tall hat, like may tell. A lot of like Cartoon Network sort of cartoons have those. Yeah, like right. Steven Universe says like one of the characters was basically Harlock at a certain point. And um, yeah, yeah, I remember the Lars was harlock um and, and he was being chased by Emerald. Uh, which I thought was cute. <laughs> but um, moving on, Austin. History with Matsumoto. It all started when I was
was a youth, and I learned how to speak fluent Japanese just so I could read Sexeroid, arguably uh, Matsumoto's greatest contribution to manga. But uh, aside from having definitely read all 48 chapters of Sexeroid, my first real life experience with Matsumoto was at a local bowling alley. Before he got bought out by a shitty giant corporation, we had a Brunswick zone in my area that had this very 90s thing called Cosmic Bowling. Black lights and disco balls would come on and they'd play cool music video on the score screens. And then one day, uh, is it valid when a third person does it? I see parts of Interstellar 4 5 broken up as music videos for various songs off the Daft Punk Discovery album. That was my first time I ever saw the Marianne of my youth ass looking lady he draws, and her close friends, Hero Guy and Silly Little Man, who's there to make everybody else look taller. Uh, eventually, for episode 7 of the show, Ethan would have us properly watch Interstellar. Then I'd hear about Galaxy Express, Yamato, and Harlock from Ethan while he was making academic connections to anime we were covering at the time. Uh, it wasn't until yesterday that I actually sat down and watched any of the media that put Matsumoto's name in a similar category as other early anime titans like Osamu Tezuka. In short, Sexeroid is his magnum opus. Back to you, Ethan. <laughs> God bless that Brunswick zone. Uh, Shoutouts to the copy of the Mega Man X anniversary collection on GameCube I got there for a birthday held there. That's like the one really <laughs> prominent memory in my Hell mind of yeah. that. And I think Interstellar <laughs> is like a very good like initial entry point. And then like Galaxy Express is the real test of uh, will you enjoy this man's work um, and, I, and I think most people will because Galaxy Express rules and if you say otherwise then you're wrong also shout out to uh, Sexeroid uh, God bless um, a manga style Barbarella a good first step into, into the world of science fiction writing outside of doing assistant work for Tezuka and no lastly Coop what is your history with Leiji Matsumoto so growing up, I know I had heard of Star Blazers a time or two, kind of thrown in with conversation with the thrilling adventures of Robotech <laughs> on occasion. But kind of like all these other guys, there was this album I heard by these two French guys <laughs> uh, called Discovery. And I remember seeing the music videos and like, that's really cool. And then when I was in high school, it was like early 2010s. I was like, oh, there's a whole movie movie about it? It's called Intercella 4-5? <laughs> that was my first introduction, but it wasn't, how can I put it? It was more of a passive introduction, because I think I, at the time, was more connected to Discovery, because Discovery is a kick-ass mm. album. But over time, I got older, and then recently really getting back into anime in a big way. I think the pandemic was part of that. I had a couple friends who were really into Leiji, and I always heard warm things about it, and then... Oh, well, I run into the situation we all always do because I was open to checking out Leiji. I was looking at a right stuff sale because I want to say Galaxy Express feels like my actual first starting point with it because I was looking at a right stuff sale and I needed to fill a cart for free shipping because I was grabbing a couple of 4K <laughs> Blu-rays because uh, Ross Rolatshaw told me, hey, those Cobra uh, 4K Blu-ray looks pretty good. You should go pick it up. So I did, but I filled that up with uh, the first two Galaxy Express films because I heard great things about it. And then it ended up being my favorite thing of the purchase. And since then, I've been trying to slowly work my way through different things. Uh, before we started, we talked about his movie, um, the follow-up movie, the Harlock movie, Arcadia of My Youth, which it's all right, it's all right. That and then the other Galaxy Express movies. So just kind of working my way through it. I want to watch Yamato, but I know that's complicated, involves drugs and firearms and a <laughs> bunch of other stuff. But it's it's something I'm working my way through. I really do want to see that old, uh, the original Harlock television series when I can. <laughs> yeah, no, no, completely fair. I think uh, Space Pirate is... Um probably my favorite standalone like Harlock centric piece of media I think the, mm -hmm. the 70s character designs are at their best in that Rintaro offers a lot of really distinct direction and a bit more expressive sort of visuals and animation famously sort of the death of Professor Daiba and that is, is really good I love when people die cool in anime um, <laughs> which is a weird thing to say but <laughs> it's just one of those things that anime in particular seems to get really really right but uh, moving on I, I'm 
sort of in a similar starting point from from most of you, uh, probably the first thing I saw was Interstellar um, in retrospect. But uh, my, my history with like knowing Matsumoto proper largely begins with 3.9. I'd seen just a bit of the uh, later anime series Galaxy Railways, uh, but was un- otherwise unfamiliar with his body of work. I would get my hands on a copy of Discotech's uh, initial DVD release of this film, uh, which I eventually upgraded to Blu-ray, of course. But I, but I really fell in love with it. It sort of sent me down that rabbit hole, um, similar to Coop, again, where I would watch the other Matsumoto features of the day, uh, Adieu, Galaxy Express, and 3.9, uh, the Yamato films, which are, you know, a bit more loosely connected to him, but all the same. Queen Millennia and Arcadia of My Youth. And I would pursue the various Yamato series and their Star Blazers adaptations, um, just because I, I like dubs. I think they're neat. It's a historical mm-hmm. artifact. I've been slowly but surely sort of working my way through Galaxy Express 39 series over the course of like a decade, basically. <laughs> um, just like every once in a while, I'll remember it exists and then watch a few episodes. And it's, well, it's, it's very true. conducive to that. And, you know, fairly recently, again, I've got my hands on like the Emeraldus manga and Yamato manga and, and Harlock manga. I've been working my way through those as well. And of course, in terms of, you know, works influenced by him, Matsumoto's popularization of space opera in, in Japanese animation is still, you know, tremendous, uh, you know, particularly relevant to this group. Uh, works like SDF, Matt Cross, and, and to an extent, stuff like the Gundam films and Tomino's succeeding catalog, so on and so forth, owe themselves to this uh, trailblazing, uh, starblazing even, <laughs> haha, uh, oeuvre. But moving on into more specific discussion of, the, of this film in general, and what were your expectations uh, going to Galaxy Express 3.9, whether for the first time or for a revisit? Tim, if you'd like to start us off. You know, just kind of having that brief history with Harlock, having seen the old Harlock TV show, I had some familiarity with uh, this like world and set of characters, so I was kind of interested to just see another installment in that sort of universe and see those characters again uh, expectations wise you know, I just figured it'd be another fun trip in that world what kind of a place is this a place where you can do whatever you want completely fair again just kind of not sure what to go in uh, go with when you're not necessarily super familiar with Matsumoto and I feel like this is a lot of people's entryway into Matsumoto works for the first time so uh, I definitely get it it's the one that introduces you to everything so you're not sure what to expect Ooh. Joe expectations I had zero expectations going in. I didn't even know that the guy who did some work on Interstellar 4 or 5 was even involved with this up until today, literally. I went in completely blind. I just wanted a good time, a good ride. Did I have one? Find out soon. Is something wrong? Huh? Well, no, it's just I'm, I'm not used to, you know, uh, eating at fancy places like this. Austin. Expectations going into Galaxy Express 3.9. Well, uh, seeing as this was the era that preceded the 1981 anime New Century announcement that put Gundam and Macross on top, my outlook going into this was grim. Uh, You see, hating the first two Gundam movies is my primary character trait. I figured if the Legiverse got knocked off the top of the food chain by something as boring as early Gundam, it must be pretty subpar. I figured I was in for extremely limited animation a la Speed Racer or clutch cargo, maybe some creative science fiction ideas spread thin over a boring package that makes me go, yeah, this is from 1979. You see, as one of the leading investors of Quibi and Theranos, I have a good history with judgment. So uh, that's what I thought I was in for. Back to you, Ethan. Fuck you. (laughs) Huh? This is the famous Galaxy Express? Yes, you don't approve. Well, no! I hate it. (laughs) You need to watch that third Gundam movie. I'm going to make you edit three separate podcasts. Next year, we're going to do another anime month, and it'll be the three Gundam movies in Char's counterattack. Oh, no. I love TV on the big screen. Looks great blown up. Yas's yeah, yeah, animation direction. It's so good. It translates even to the... You, don't, you just don't get it, Dad. Coop, <laughs> what were your expectations going into Galaxy Express 3.9? You know, before we move on, I will say I do agree with Austin. Those first two Gundam movies ain't great. They ain't yeah. great. Watch the show instead. Um, but the, the third movie is cool, Austin. I will tell you right now. It's worth a watch. But yeah, going into it, from what I heard, it was very much a warm reception when I asked people who were in the Leiji and a lot of people said it was their first go around, so I was excited to check it out when I first saw it back in December. And now I was just like, this movie's great. 
it's even better, but uh, this movie, this movie, man. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a good response. I think it, it, it is sort of um, a magical experience. I feel like mm-hmm. I use that for a lot of films, but I don't know. The, the early 80s, uh, late 70s was a good time for magical sorts of experiences. Soon I'll become the soul of the Arcadia, the starship of my best friend. I will say you talk about using the term magical a lot. Sometimes, yes, that can be a little overused and over a little rote. Here, I, I think it is very, very, very fitting. Uh, for, for me, going into 3.9, w- when I was very first viewing it, I didn't have a ton in the way of expectations, uh, just sort of general knowledge of its larger pedigree and significance. I was loosely familiar with Matsumoto's iconography. Again, you know, figures like Harlock and Maytel. I'd seen, seen appearances by, by similar characters that were, you know, parodies. I think I think Megas XLR has a, a parody of <laughs> Harlock that crops up. And I, I was always really impressed by the, the look of it. Uh, it looks so very loose, especially compared to some of his contemporaries like Tezuka or Ishinomori, who had that very sort of soft and round style. But uh, since viewing it, that's one I always look forward to revisiting in general. This time I was more anticipating how it stands up in context, I guess. Uh, the film is sort of a return to form for Toei, doing these long form animated features not made from existing television animation, riding that wave of success from the first two Yamato films, the second of which was sort of an originally created thing, but also the animation from that was meant to be repurposed into a TV show. And also, I guess, sh- shout-outs to Taro the Dragon Boy, uh, which is a very good Toei feature that came out the same year, but is generally less discussed and was not pushed nearly as hard as this film. It, it wasn't the number one box office grocer in Japan, who could have thought, uh, despite being very good itself. But I think in, in that particular context, it makes the film a lot more impressive as sort of this this great awakening of the, the Japanese animated theatrical tradition, sort of following off after uh, Animal Treasure Island, some might say. I think, I think the second Puss in Boots film is, is good enough that I'll consider that the, the end point of that period. But before we go into our overall thoughts, a brief ad break. Gonna take a break at this station or whatever, something witty. Um, Taking a stop at Pluto. That crazy dog. Who are you, kid? Stop calling me kid. I happen to have a name. It's Joey Hannah Cannababa Cananda Smith. Ready for another ad? Because that's what you're getting. Do you like uh, pieces of canvas with colors from frames of movies? If you're looking for a nice piece of wall art and you you want, you want something that represents the palette of a particular film you enjoy, moviepalettes.com is a great resource for that. And if you want a nice discount on it, then just put in the code SQUAD15 at checkout. You get a discount if we get a little bit of money for a nice piece of wall art. I know I'm not selling it very well, uh, but it's really just good to kind of poke around and see like just put in your favorite movie. Uh, they do custom ones too. So if you don't see your film you like represented, you can pay just a little bit extra and get one custom made just for you. Um, now that I'm done supporting capitalism, let's talk about a movie that is is arguably fairly critical of capitalism, mm-hmm. uh, or at least I don't know, social stratification. Uh, move on to our overall thoughts upon viewing uh, things that stood out to us and how the whole work holds together. Starting us off, Tim. Movie good. <laughs> he said so, yeah 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 i had a good time with it i did kind of enjoy it as this sort of kid-friendly like adventure type movie where you're just following this uh young boy through his adventures it's not like, super action oriented but like everything is still really enjoyable throughout the whole time on the bullet train podcast we briefly talked about movies set on trains and i brought up night on the galactic railroad and uh this is sort of goes on some similar routes like it's sort of a movie where you're following these people on this train and like getting off at different stops going on different little adventures in these little worlds I mean I thought that that was neat uh, just sort of the exploration of all these different worlds and my brief sort of tangential familiarity with some of these characters like uh, I loved seeing Harlock like Emeraldus and Maytel were fun to see in the movie uh, yeah there's, there's just a lot to enjoy about it based both on my familiarity with these characters and uh, just as a fun ride and I think the ending was like very enjoyable to watch too like it was a very like interesting moment I guess won't we ever meet again but when the time comes and I return you won't know who I am I might be standing right next to you but you won't know me Overall, very good movie. Makes me want to explore the Leiji verse a little bit more. Maybe revisit that Harlock TV show and 
familiarize myself a little bit more with it because uh, you know just seeing those characters in that world more just makes me want to explore more. It sets a lot of ground in terms of this interesting space that uh, Matsumoto explores, both like on a thematic level and on a, like nuts and bolts characters and iconography that crop up in, in thing after thing. It's it's not good to ever try and chart sort of a consistent chronology because Matsumoto like actively resists that. Um, like he, he, I'm convinced he actually does things to just kind of throw you off of that. But uh, no, m- moving moving on. Joe, overall thoughts on the feature, the picture. All right, quick for context sakes, I watched the uh, the dubbed version, so the actors were speaking English the whole time. I know that's uh, sacrilege sometimes, but screw it. Um, anyway, uh, I actually really f***ing liked this movie a lot. Yes! Yeah. I have been waiting a while for, like, an anime, like, movie to just click with me like this did, and man, oh f***ing man, I'm so happy that it was this one, because it, it literally just has, like, so much like crammed into it and it's like this really f***ing entertaining and well told movie it's got fantasy elements it's a cowboy movie it's a pirate movie it's a sci-fi film it's a drama about a boy and his mom it's a great train movie uh, a better <laughs> polar express movie than the polar express and this doesn't even have christmas in it mm-hmm. yeah uh, i had a f- blast with this the characters are fucking likable i love the fucking look of the movie i know we have a question on that later but the looks incredible if i did have one complaint at least on this watch i i want to go back and rewatch this that's how much i actually really enjoyed this awesome. uh, at least in the first viewing it felt like it kind of dragged just a little bit in places but that's just like a minor nitpick but yeah uh <laughs> there's so much to fucking love about this and everyone's been mentioning harlock i had no idea who the fuck harlock was up until today and his f- intro in this where he uses milk as a weapon <laughs> yeah it is the greatest character intro i've seen in a hot minute and i want to see like 20 f- movies based on him and to my surprise there's a whole f- damn series about him so i'm gonna get on that f- right f- now Hell yeah. Uh, overall yeah i loved this this was fun back to you ethan thanks for introducing me to this We value life because we know it'll end, but when it goes on forever, what's the use of being kind to each other? Hell yeah, I'm glad you had such a warm response to it. Um, I was worried because it has some strangeness to it. I'll be the first to admit that. um, That that might be a little bit alienating to some viewers, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, Love, love Harlock uh, milking that guy. Uh, it's extremely good bit. Um, I really, I, I really, really love it in the the Corman dub, um, the New World Pictures dub, when it's ca- he's Captain Warlock doing a bad John Wayne impression. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you're Captain Warlock. Bartender, bring a glass of milk. Very good. Is this the town with no name adaptation? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit. Give me a drink, bartender. But no, I'm glad you enjoyed it so much. And also, uh, guess what? There's there's a television series based on this with 113 episodes. It's it's great. Like it's very episodic and, and a lot of fun. Uh, Tetsuro looks like a delightful potato man, like he does in the flashback <laughs> with his mom, but for the entire series. <laughs> Yeah, mostly I'm just really glad you liked it so much. That's very nice. <laughs> Warms the cockles of my heart. Um, Same. Austin, overall thoughts upon viewing the Galaxy Express 3.9? Uh, this is a spectacular film that holds up quite well. Uh, the plot about a future where people can overcome death via advanced technology and then lose their humanity doing so, forming this weird upper class of tyrants who commit atrocities against the less fortunate, it's pretty timeless. I think the structure of the screenplay also rocks socks. You get your typical, like, three-act hero avenges his mother plot with a bonus twist ending and a secret final boss. When I put two and two together about why that last planet at the end of the line had a reputation for giving out free robot bodies, I had, like, that big, oh, sh- moment, and it was really cool. You, you're turning me into a bolt for real? Correct. A living bolt with a soul. I didn't know before that this was basically the Avengers Endgame of 1979 back in Japan. Highest grossing movie of the year, and the adventure was fun enough and thought-provoking enough to make me understand why that happened, even 44 years later watching it now. There are these heavy themes about, like, how life being finite is essential to helping us cherish the people around us, or that nostalgia can be painful, but those reminders of what we've lost since our youth compel us along our journeys. Like, a very advanced starship disguised as a 
uh, 20th century train taking you somewhere far away from home, probably never to return. Speaking of that, I'm so happy somebody decided to adapt Night on the Galactic Railroad into an action film. They should do this for all the slow existential classics. I'm thinking Synecdoche, New York with laser guns, baby. So I guess in conclusion, the story ha and pacing really hold up. The animation is certainly more primitive than people these days might be used to, especially those like choppy zoom out shots. But I, I found that it has the effects where the lack of constant razzle dazzle makes you appreciate the action and spectacle when it does happen. But it felt like going on an actual journey through space with thoughtful story beats that help you meditate on philosophical concepts. The characters rule. I see why the Legiverse was so popular back in the day. Overall, a really tremendous time. I would recommend this to any fan of animation who likes science fiction at all. It's a great special film. Thank you for showing it to me. Yeah, I, I very much agree. I do think it's a great special film. I think I think the level of social stratification, that sort of thing, you know, it's 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 not subtle, but the, the whole film is so unsubtle uh, that it, it doesn't really like I don't know stand out as, as preachy or like paying lip service to something. It's, it's just such a sincerely told sort of story that even even its occasional maybe missteps are, are forgivable because it's just told with such tremendous heart. I've outdone myself. It will go very well on the wall of my lodge, don't you think? A fine in addition to my collection. And I think it's it's really Reen Taro at his best. This is, you know, adapting, like, most of the events of this film happen with, like, within the first eight or nine episodes of the television series, and then it cuts to, like, the very end with Heavy Melder and um, Prometheum. This was, uh, like, this revealed the entire ending to the series. They spoiled it. <laughs> yeah, not just the series, like, like the manga as well, because uh, because production on this b began as the, I think, three days before the show started, just purely based on how well Harlock was doing and the popularity of Yamato. Just a big Akira energy of just like, we got to make our ending now and we'll figure it out in the manga later. <laughs> a little bit of that. Um, like, yeah, there is like a whole second half and like the, the Galaxy Express Eternal sort of stuff. But no, I think uh, despite that caveat, um, the, the episodic nature of it, it makes the, the Ring Taro pacing go down a little bit easier for a wider audience. Um, I'm much like with Tomino, I've been Ring Taro pilled enough that I can, that I actually really jive with this kind of erratic sort of at times meandering pacing and stuff, to stuff like Dagger of Kamui or, or Genma Tyson slash Harmageddon, as a lot of people have, have critiqued before. He's just a very good filmmaker who makes uh, a shock amount of films about uh, very stark social stratification and robots. Uh, see all show Metropolis 2001. But no, I'm, I'm glad you had such a good time with it um, and uh, that you enjoyed it. This this is great. There's a sequel to this movie that we could talk about at some point. As soon as we're done talking about Megazone 2, 3, part 2. No! Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no! I miss the old animation style. I do too, but it's fine. Sh Shogo and Yui have a more healthy relationship, so it's a good trade-off. Uh, uh, boy, the Umetsu designs. Uh, Umetsu does what Umetsu wants to do if you've seen Kite and his other things with those two pretty fast. Mm. Oh, boy. Oh, no, not Kite. Yeah. Anything but Kite. Not Kite. Austin, I have, I have the Blu-ray of the edited version of Kite, so you don't have to look for a of Kite. I, I don't know if I should own a copy of Kite. Just put in footage from the live action version. I was about to say that. But no, uh, Coop, uh, your overall thoughts upon viewing the film. Yes. So the first time I watched this film, I made a point of sitting down, having all my phone, having everything turned off, the lights down low, and was just kind of mesmerized because you start watching it and I'm just like, it's hitting like the feeling of being like I was never a Star Wars kid, but the feeling of seeing Star Wars for the first time as a young kid, that pure joy. And then you hear as an adult myself who've seen some other things, I hear that we're now taking off. And I think to myself, wait a second, is this song by that guy, those guys who told me that cherries are made for eating? <laughs> <laughs> Because Godaigo's songs and the music in this really punctuate it, and I couldn't help but think of House at the same time, <laughs> which is fantastic. Oh, that movie rocks. Hell yeah. But taking off just like, I think I remember welling up a little bit because it just, it told me we were, I was about to watch something special. And even though it was a little bit of time in. Life is like a kind of journey. One that begins and ends in the sea of stars. 
And as the rest of it goes on, I'm just like, wow, this is one of those movies I'd love to show my nephews at some point when they're a little bit older, uh, because <laughs> uh, something in Count Mecca's castle would be a little bit uh, <laughs> just shocking to show a, show a young kid. But yeah, just going throughout the whole thing and the message of, hey, it's your life and <laughs> you got one life and you got to live it to your best uh, and do what the most of you really struck, especially because uh, the death of uh, Kentaro Miura is like always on my mind in a lot mm-hmm. of ways uh, about these great creators passing away. And Matsumoto too, uh, especially considering like, dude lived a very long and good life too, which is fantastic. But that weighed pretty heavily on me at the time. But as far as taking myself out of it because I, I get all gooey and mushy when it comes to this movie as you could already tell I, I just love this movie I agree with you Joe that some of the pacing is a little choppy but I think for me the first time watching it it's kind of overwhelming with how much information you're being given in each new set piece but when I came mm-hmm. back to rewatch it for this episode I'm just like this movie's perfect man like a little bit at the end it when they're at that final planet it's a li- little long a little bit but I I'll take that extra cherry on top, man, because it's it's just great. It's a great movie. I I would honestly, people who aren't even really into anime should check this out, which makes me so excited that y'all love it so much, especially hearing Joe and Austin scream about it. I'm just like, okay, I would love to see a theatrical run of this. Like it needs to be up there with the Miyazaki stuff shown regularly. It's Mm. that good. Uh, I think that's absolutely 100% true. Like, it really demands to be seen on a big screen. Mm-hmm. Um, in the original aspect ratio, it's a 4 by 3 film uh, that's been been cut down. Toei, curse you. But shout-outs to that wonderful restoration Discotheque did, specifically the one with the nice grain and everything. Ooh. It hits you on a very emotional level, and mm-hmm. in sort of honing in on, on your initial point, too, um, I love that Go Daigo musical number, because mm-hmm. it, I, I used to have a real affection for the one in the Corman number that uses the instrumental version of mm-hmm. Taking Off, because it's a bit more like... Like the rest of that film, it tries to kind of iron out the, the tonal inconsistency. <laughs> But I love that Go Daigo number specifically because it, it really cements like this is kind of a weird movie. Like like the tone will be kind of all over the place, but it just takes that in its stride and presents it so confidently that the end result is this wonderfully unique film that can really decompress when it feels like it needs to. I'm, I'm going to transition into my own thoughts on it uh, because it, it remains my very favorite animated adaptation of Matsumoto's work. Not a controversial opinion at all. Uh, I, I don't think anyways, but still. It's just such a great encapsulation of Matsumoto's strengths. Uh, the themes of humanity juxtaposing a young hero rising from an earth corrupted by apathy and deep social stratification, crossing the threshold into adulthood as he realizes the importance of life. Uh, that episodic nature suits uh, its runtime really well um, and offers a little something for everyone, uh, with the interstitials on the 3-9 offering a bit more interaction and sort of the ability to, to again, sort of decompress uh, with Tetsuro and Maytel sort of developing their characters and the the morals learned, I suppose, on a certain level on each planet. Though I do miss Maytel's whip um, when she's confronting Shadow. She's a bit more of an active uh, character in the television series, mm-hmm. perhaps. But I do like that grounding point uh, that we get between the two and between every trip to a planet, um, even if sometimes they're interrupted by intrusions by <laughs> Emeraldus. Notably, uh, it has my favorite use of Harlock and Emeraldus in animation. I just think Harlock works wonderfully as this sort of mythical supporting character. Mm. Absolutely. And his presence here is sort of a larger than life figure and how he's built up before finally making his grand appearance, milking that man are just pitch perfect. Lastly, that sort of uh, tonal strangeness that I I mentioned before, it's just this really enchanting, unique sort of thing, uh, juxtaposing frank depictions of death, sort of strange comic interludes, philosophizing and fisticuffs in turn just culminates in a really distinctive stew and very much lays the ground for anime moving forward in general, like as a whole. It's not purely children's fare, like the old uh, Toei Golden Age stuff, which I, I love to death, but you know, it is more in line maybe with with Disney mold, despite some occasional outcroppings like Horus. And it's not adult material like Lupin the Third, The Mystery of Mamo. Uh, it's this distinctive singular sort of vision from a unique creative uh, that will in many ways shape the development of the medium moving into the space opera do- dominated 1980s. Farewell, Tetsuro. May we meet again someday in the Sea of Stars. 
Uh, moving on to the very final question. Uh, thoughts on the film's animation and visual design. Tim, if you'd like to stop us off. It's sort of along the same lines as uh, like Cobra, where it's just a lot of really interesting looking, like just space fantasy sci-fi stuff. Lots of like really great looking environments and uh, really fascinatingly drawn characters. Yeah, there's, there's just a lot to love about it. Completely agree. Joe, if you'd like to go. I think that this movie looks f***ing incredible, and it makes me wonder just how much of the sci-fi that I specifically, like, really enjoy was inspired by this, because especially in the beginning, I was getting a lot of Blade Runner vibes. Like, this looks like the Blade Runner city. It kind of looks like Akira. The uh, zoom-ins that are in the movie kind of actually reminded me of the enhanced bit from Blade Runner, funnily enough. But, yeah, no, I, I think it looks great. I love how very distinct the worlds are in this especially like every single world in this has an identity you can point out exactly where you are and just like look at like small minute details in it and it just tells you so much it's really well detailed very beautiful to look at i absolutely adored the look of this yeah i completely agree i think the the blade runner connection is is notable too because sid mead the production designer on that film actually well he famously worked on gundam turn a gundam but also he worked on a yamato project um, Ooh. oh yeah that's right the later era yeah, sort of Yamato projects, um, which, you know, sort of tying things together. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he'd uh, familiarized himself with Matsumoto's earlier work as well, um, even at this point, because, you know, it was sort of popularly distributed by uh, Roger Corman's New World Pictures on home video. It had sort of that cult appeal. But no, Austin, thoughts on the film's animation and visual design? Uh, contrary to my initial expectations going in, uh, there were plenty of unique frames of animation in this film. Uh, there wasn't a moment in this film that felt like the Evangelion elevator scene. The character <laughs> design by Kazuo Kamatsubara felt iconic. Nearly everybody except the extras in the heavy melder bar looked cool as hell. Uh, it was funny seeing expressionistic design choices occasionally, rarely, mostly on a couple of the animals, uh, such as the red cat outside the bar on heavy melder, what the hell, or Mr. Bird, the weird looking animal Harlock and company <laughs> rescued in Arcadia of my youth. Even when you're more acclimated to the style of the movie, stuff like many women looking like Maytel or uh, the d two different people having the same Heidelberg dueling scar, moments like seeing Mr. Bird still add some fun levity to things. Shout out to the very retro kaleidoscope shots of Maytel and Tetsuro booking it after blowing up the robot mm. planet. Those were a neat addition. And the, the two sort of climactic scenes of environments falling apart felt properly huge and impressive. Uh, Yoshinori Kanada and the animation team really nailed the action and effects in that sequence. Uh, Love the shot where Harlock's grinning during the battle after getting hit by a laser like, man, I always get shot in the coolest places. Uh, there was plenty <laughs> to see in here, and it had a good deal of personality packed into the details. 110% agree. Uh, those kaleidoscope shots with uh, the Planet Maytel sort of theme sort of blaring in the background with those vocalizations is so, so, so good. It sends shivers down my spine like every time. Coop, overall thoughts on the film's animation visual design? Movie is gorgeous. Movie is gorgeous. It holds up like so amazingly. Boy, you gotta show this to people. And also, I was thinking while Austin was talking about the heavy melder bar, if p uh, other people didn't notice it, hey, that Leiji Matsumoto guy shows up in the bar just kind of hanging out with everybody. Yeah, he's the guy with the beret and the glasses um, uh -huh. who's, who's hanging on, holding a sake <laughs> glass and hanging on to the redhead barmaid. Visually, I love this movie. It has so much character. And it's also, like, even though it's so fantastical, it also is very grounded all at the same time to easily let viewers uh, comprehend what's going on. I just love this film. It's gorgeous. And if I say anything more, honestly, it's just going to be cutting. <laughs> I completely agree. Uh, there's there's so much to gush about, so I'm going to try and get that all out like right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the film largely looks absolutely stellar. Uh, the actual animation may not quite match the heights of Toei's Golden Age, uh, but there's still some incredible cuts of animation here, uh, particularly Tetsuro's flight from Count Mecha's time castle as it falls apart uh, in the climactic final assault on Planet May 
may tell, uh, which features an Arcadia design by Kazutaka Miyatake of Studio Nue, um, who's going to do a bunch of work on Macross. He designed mm-hmm. all the Destroids and a bunch of the Zentradi mecha. Um, it's his, his design, and that's why that version of the Arcadia pro- crops up in Do You Remember Love? But that, that sequence of Planet May Tell and Count Mecha's Time Castle falling to bits, largely helmed by uh, Yoshinori Kanada and his disciple Kazuhide Tomonaga, uh, the way the pair of them imbue a sense of character acting to fire an effects animation on top of the you know traditional character acting is incredibly satisfying and just so masterfully presented. Um, special shout out to Tomonaga, uh, who handles the iconic uh, Harlock Milk's Machine Man scene. God bless that man. Uh, the greater detail and design work from uh, Matsumoto's characters for the screen uh, as sort of imbued upon them by uh, Kazuo Komatsubara uh, is really spectacular. Uh, the comparatively in appearance of an older Tetsuro versus his potato-faced TV counterpart um, allows him to more easily slip <laughs> into action sequences and a bit more uh, variant expressions. Uh, and generally, I just think suits the tone of the film a bit more as sort of this coming-to-age story in like a relatively compressed frame, uh, as opposed to the very episodic nature of the television series with its wildly varying tone from episode to episode. And just very lastly, uh, the blend of space western, sort of pulp SF fantasy, swashbuckling pirate fiction, uh, and gothic even visual elements, all pulling from Matsumoto's eclectic back catalog of manga in the spaces of, you know, a slice of life comedy, shoujo, science fiction, boys fair, westerns in the form of stuff like Gun Frontier, just culminates this really unique, delightful setting that I just absolutely adore. Uh, and that was a lot. So let's go into final thoughts on the film. Tim. This is one that I'm glad that we watched for the show. Um, I have been wanting to venture more into Leiji's works, and I'm glad that I had an opportunity to explore this particular installment, uh, which sort of gives you a taste of basically every little bit of that Leiji verse and uh, makes you want to explore that more. Very good movie to sort of introduce people to that world and give us something to talk about in mourning of the great Leiji Matsumoto. Joe, final thoughts. All right, final thoughts. If you're looking for a fun, action-packed adventure with relatable, heavy themes, a conductor who talks like Porky Pig, milk used as a weapon, and Tetsuro the wannabe Iron Man, then as the earworm closing credits song states, the Galaxy Express 3-9 will take you on a journey. A never-ending journey. A journey to the stars. What a movie. F- loved it glad i saw it back to you ethan hell yeah austin final thoughts Journey to the stars. coop final thoughts oh i love that song it teared me up when i first heard it i i, I f-ing love this movie Woo! i bought it on laserdisc so it's like it's a classic uh as i said before the people who are not really into anime it's not their super kind of thing they're super interested please show this to them show it to more people it's an amazing film that i think everybody will love um also that dub that joe watched it as well that i first saw it with is fantastic and a wonderful introduction to tons of audiences for this film this movie's amazing my words are getting less coherent i love it that much please go watch it and as these yahoos said it will take you for a journey (laughs) Hell yeah. My final thoughts in the immortal words of Joey Hanakana Babakananda Smith. Holy moon cow. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you, Coop. Um, all those links um, and to his podcasting work, writing at Zimbrit, Anime Herald, and Anime News Network will be down below. Um, and you should go take a look at them. But thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know who else uh, should not get a mechanical body or whatever. I never do these as well, Tanners, whatever. Be sure to like, uh, comment, and subscribe <laughs> to this channel, please. Leave a comment to boost us in the algorithm. That'd be appreciated. And if you're looking for an uncensored version of this podcast, uh, you can check it out on Spotify Video. But we're also in a variety of other podcatchers, um, so if you use one of those, please, by all means, uh, give, give us five stars, etc. And of course, we have a Patreon, which will have content dedicated to it specifically, I'm sure, sometime, eventually, maybe. But if you would like to toss some money to us it would be much appreciated next time it's a bird it's a plane it's bomb squad movie night a discussing richard donner's 1978 classic superman the movie in a special discussion hosted by our very own joe rennick it's me i'm hosting again but until then adieu arrivederci sayonara and farewell friends viewers and matsumoto sensei may we meet again in the sea of stars Farewell, days of youth. 
Farewell, Galaxy Express 39. I slid my ticket across the table and I said, sorry guys, I gotta see about a girl.